listening to stories about God. My favorite thing about Kids City is that we get to watch videos. I like Kids City because it has some great pastures and it, and it gives you some good life lessons about loving God. Good morning, Bright City Church. It is so good to be with you all this morning. My name is Ike Miller. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is good to be back in this space this morning. The last couple of weeks, I've been down in Kid City serving and having a blast down there. Uh, I want to take a moment to just recognize our Kid City volunteers because we have some great leaders, some great teachers, and so getting to see that up close and personal last week was awesome. So can we give them a hand? They're doing a fantastic job down there serving. We are still in search of 10 new volunteers to join our Kid City team by next weekend. And uh, part of that is we are looking to move to two services uh, for kids' ministry. Right now we're just doing that during the second service. We need to do that during both services so we can help spread out the crowd a little bit. So as you can see, things are tight in this service, and so that will help us to do that. So if you would like to join our Kid City team and be a part of that team, I want to invite you to fill out this card. There's one either in your desk or the person next to you, um, or you can click on this QR code and uh, fill out the Serve with Bright City Church and click Kid City. But we would love to have you join that team so that September 11th we can run into that. That fully, uh, fully equipped for jumping into two services for that. Well, one of the things that we say around here is that we exist to help you take your next step towards Christ. That's a part of why we exist as a community. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. But if you are new with us this morning, your first step is to let us know that you're here. Uh, you can let us know on the card. You can scan the QR code and click on connect with us. Uh, and also after the service, Sharon will be out at our Next Steps booth. So there's the kind of a little white banner out there. Uh, Sharon will be there to answer any questions or just to meet you. You don't have to have questions to go talk with her. Uh, uh, you can just introduce yourself. Would love to know that you're here and help make this feel a little bit more like home for you. In terms of taking steps towards Christ, another step that we believe every follower of Jesus should take at some point is the step to give. We believe that giving is tangibly demonstrating the priority of God in our lives. And so if you consider Bright City your home and you want to partner with us financially, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Again, you can do that on the QR code or you can go to brightcitychurch.com slash give uh, and give online. Another step you can take is serving. Uh, so maybe it's not kids, but maybe you want to serve with guest services or with the worship team or uh, leading a small group, whatever it may be. There's lots of ways that you can serve, but we believe that serving is how we use our time in alignment with God's priorities for our lives. This is the way that we utilize our lives in a ways that fulfills God's purposes. So if you would like to serve, I want to invite you to take this card and you can fill it out and put on the back. I'd love to. And there's all kinds of areas to serve in. Worship team, guest services, Kid City. And I want to say, recognizing that almost every chair is full in here and not every chair has one of these, I want to point out that does not mean God is saying you should not serve. Okay? You just, just reach across your seat, buddy, grab that card, fill it out, and give it to somebody in a black t-shirt. Also, this is not just for new folks or those that want to serve. If you have prayer requests, uh, our staff prays over these prayer requests every week during our staff meeting. And so if there's something you would like our team to be praying about, you can fill that out and let us know on there as well. Uh, one of the main areas that we need uh, servant leaders also is small group leaders. And so if you are interested in leading a small group, that is something that we have a huge need for right now as new people are coming in. We want to create a space for people to go beyond Sunday, a place for them to feel connected and to be in community beyond just Sunday morning. So if you uh, feel led to lead a small group, maybe you're in a small group and want to take that step to lead one, we would love to know that. You can mark that on here as well. Click on uh, serve in another way and then just write small groups in the blank at the bottom. Uh, or you can come find me or Sharon or email small groups at brightcitychurch.com. Last announcement for us this morning. Super excited. Tonight at 8 p.m. we have another church meeting. 
uh, around the search for a building. And so we're going to take some time tonight around 8 p.m. to update you on where things are in the search for a building. Uh, Actually, some interesting timing. A new prospect came on this week that I'm excited to share with you guys about. That's a strong possibility for us. And so I just kind of want to share the journey with you, where we're at, where we're headed. If you don't have the link for that, you can find that in one of our previous Friday emails. There's a Zoom link in those emails. Or you can email info at brightcitychurch.com and get the link for that tonight. All right, that's all I've got. Hand it over to Sharon for the third week of The Cost of Control. Thank you. Yeah, on that note of the building, I want to invite you guys also just to be praying. We've had, for the last several weeks, just so many different things going wrong. I don't know if y'all noticed the leak right outside the door as you walked in. And if you've been here the last couple weeks, there was actually, we kept jokingly referring to it as a water feature, but there was water dripping into a bucket right here. And obviously we're outgrowing this space. And so in every possible way, it feels kind of like God is saying, it's time for you to move on. And we're like, great. God, where? And so we have our ears tuned to what is next for us and would really appreciate your prayer in that as well. But if you are new, we are continuing our series, The Cost of Control, which is based on a book that I just released into the world last week. And thank you. And this is week three, and as we kick off this morning, I actually wanted to begin by sharing a story that is not in the book and that I actually have not shared really publicly yet, a a very personal story, you know, something that, that Ike and I really believe is the importance of being vulnerable with you guys, but also giving ourselves time to process it before we share things publicly. And so that's why it's not in the book. But I felt like it was time to, to share this kind of what was going on in my heart and in my mind for the last two years. Now, those of you who have been at Bright City for a while, know that two years ago, kind of at the early end of the pandemic, that Ike hit this wall of emotional exhaustion, and he hit it very hard. And he has shared this with our church. He has also written about it as well. But what that looked like for him is he was on this anxiety medication and started to develop this really unhealthy relationship with it. And and thankfully, God was able to alert both of us to it very early on, and he was able to rest and to, you know, take all the steps that he needed to get healthy. And he has shared a lot about what that was like. And he, since then, is in a completely different place, praise God. But I have never shared publicly what that experience was like for me. And the fact of the matter was, it was really, really difficult. And it was very, very scary. Because Ike, if you have met him, Ike is the hero. You know, he's the hero of our family. He is the hero of my world. He takes really good care of me and our kids. He is wise. He is strong. He is responsible. You know, all the things. And so in a lot of ways, my world, a lot of my foundation was kind of, it was mostly standing on Jesus, but it was also kind of standing on Ike. And so to see him at his lowest and at his weakest was really terrifying for me. And thankfully, I took all the steps that he needed to be wise and to heal and to be in a better place. But even knowing that, because it was so scary and because it was so hard on us, I responded by becoming hyper-vigilant about him. And I switched into this mode of thinking that it was now my job to make sure that Ike was okay and to make sure also that he was being honest with me about the fact that he was okay. And so this became the dynamic of our marriage for, I would say, at least a year. And the irony of it is I thought I was doing this to protect him and to protect us But what was really happening was I was actually doing more harm in the end. And and part of the reason for that is I was stepping in and saying, I think these are the steps that you need to take to heal. These are the steps you need to take to be better and, and for us. But 
do you know what I am not? I am not a licensed counselor. I didn't know what I was doing. And so I'm giving him, you know, these ideas. And in hindsight, and, and thankfully, even our marriage counselor was able to, you know, advise me of this to say, this is actually not helpful. In fact, this is actually going to harm him in the end. And so me stepping in to essentially control the situation and, and try to guarantee that it wouldn't happen again was, was actually making things worse. And that's part of the reason why, if, if any of you know anything about Al-Anon, which is a support group for loved ones of alcoholics, one of their core axioms is that you cannot control this person. And that is an axiom of Al-Anon because it is true. You cannot control it. There's nothing you can do to make them make the right choices. But another reason why it's an, an axiom is in the process of trying, you will probably make it worse. Now, thankfully, at some point along the line, I came to the realization that this is what was happening. And that, that epiphany was super duper helpful because along the way, you know, as I mentioned, we, we've had the same marriage counselor for 12 years. We're big fans of marriage counseling. We recommend everyone get a marriage counselor. Amen? Amen. So while we were walking through all this with her, she would say, you know, you can't control this. Like, you're trying to control this. And I would know, okay, I shouldn't try to control this. I need to let go. And as long as I've been a Christian, I know I shouldn't, I shouldn't control. I should, you know, surrender. I should let go. I should trust God. But that was actually never helpful to me at any point in time. Like, knowing that you should do something is not as compelling as knowing why. And the cost of this control on our marriage, that was a big why for me. And so this morning, what I want to do with you all is look at the costs of control in our life. That is the title of this book, The Cost of Control. And my hope for you this morning is that by highlighting three big ones in particular, that for some of you, and I've, I've been praying this for a lot of you, that this would be an epiphany for you. That you would realize, I'm actually, this is costing me in this area of my life, and I don't want to pay that cost anymore. That this would be the moment we were finally motivated to let go. So we're going to be back in Genesis 3 again this morning. This is our third week being in Genesis 3. We're going to look at a slightly shorter passage this morning. And for those of you who have hung with this every week and you're like, Genesis 3 again, you know, we're doing this again. But part of the reason I wanted to, to go back over this, even though it feels like we're retrotting old territory, is a lot of us only ever go this deep into Scripture, but the fact of the matter is, Scripture goes miles, miles deep. And so my hope in, in going over this again and again is, is you're seeing new things that you didn't notice before, and that will encourage you to do the same when you are reading Scripture on your own. So we're going to be in Genesis 3, starting with verse 6, and picking up to that, that moment where Adam and Eve are about to reach for this fruit of the tree of knowledge and eat it. So Genesis 3, starting with verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. This is the word of the Lord. And I want to just pause for a moment as we go into this and actually 
pray together to center our hearts and minds to receive this message. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active, that it, it, it cuts through our hearts sharper than a double-edged sword. And so I pray this morning that you will do what I cannot, that you will take this message and use it to not just illuminate, but to liberate. Because we do not have to live with these costs. I thank you that we do not have to live with these costs. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So if you are new, just a very, very brief review. We have spent the last couple weeks looking at this moment in Scripture and talking about how every time we run to control, to empower us in some way, or to soothe our anxieties, or to fill us with, with confidence, what we are actually doing is reenacting this moment in Genesis 3. Because prior to this moment, Adam and Eve had lived in complete freedom, and complete peace, and complete joy, and perfect community. They lacked nothing. But there was one thing that they did not possess, and that was control. And so in this moment, they eat of this fruit thinking that it will empower them even more, and it betrays them instead. And so we've looked at how every time we reach for control, we don't just reenact that moment, but we reenact its consequences as well. And so what I want to do is look at three in particular. There are more, and, and if you want to read the book, it goes into others as well. But the, the big three that we see in this passage specifically is what I want to look at this morning, starting with verse 10. So in verse 10, this is the first time that we hear Adam speak after he has just eaten of this fruit. And this is what he says to God, explaining why he was hiding. He says, I was afraid because I was naked. Now, because he equates, he links this fear with his nakedness, we tend to assume that this is an expression of shame. And I think that there is some of that going on because of him hiding. Hiding is one of the primary ways that we cope with our own shame. And yet, at the same time, that is not what he says here. He doesn't say, I was ashamed. He doesn't say, I was embarrassed or humiliated. Instead, he says he was afraid. In the Hebrew here, it's very clear this is about fear. And, and this is actually the first appearance of fear in the Bible. And so to my mind, this raises a question, why was he scared? Why was he afraid? And I suspect it's because what he's actually talking about here is the reality of his new vulnerability in the world. What's happening here, it actually reminds me a little bit of my oldest son, Isaac, who today is actually his birthday. He's turning 10. And yes, if you see him, give him a high five. But Isaac, occasionally he tells me that he wishes I would have 12 kids. And when I ask him why, why do you want me to have 12 kids? Well, first of all, I say, that is not going to happen. But why do you want 12 kids? And it's because he has this, this fantasy. He says, well, if we have 12 kids, then the kids can take over. <laughs> and the kids can be in charge. And if you know Isaac, you know this is very on brand for him. And so whenever he says this to me, occasionally I'll sort of play along and I'll be like, all right, well, you know, if you want to be in charge, I need to just go to the grocery store right now. So can I just leave you to take care of your brother and sister? And I will play it totally straight. And at first, he'll like kind of laugh, but then he'll be searching my face to see any hint of me actually joking. And I'm just like, try me. Like, I'm being serious. I'm for real. I'm about to leave you right now. And in that moment, his face, it shifts from laughing to sheer terror. Because he knows deep down that we are his protection. We are the ones that keep him safe. And if we leave, then that protection leaves with it. And if we leave, then it means that he is the one in charge. It is all on him now. I think we are seeing a similar realization in this moment with Adam. 
Adam desired to be in charge, to be in control, and he got what he wanted. He cast off God's protection and is immediately confronted with the reality of that. And that leads us to the first cost of control that I want to look at this morning, which is anxiety. Anxiety. Anytime we try to control something that we cannot control, it, it, it produces anxiety in us. And, and one thing that's important to understand is how integrally this is linked. Control actually creates anxiety in us. Trying to control something we cannot control actually creates anxiety in us. Now, it's not the only source of anxiety. Anxiety can be caused by so many different things. But whenever we run to something thinking, this is the thing that is going to empower me. This is the thing that is finally going to help me feel in control. This is the thing that is going to soothe my anxieties. And it fails... That is the moment when what happens is it highlights even more prominently that which we really are, which is limited, vulnerable, only human. Now, of course, we don't realize all of that in the moment. We just feel it as anxiety. And unfortunately, what happens is we, we don't even realize that's what's happening because we just blame the thing. This thing over here is why I feel this way. And we don't realize, yes, maybe that is true, but how you are responding to it is actually ratcheting up your anxiety even more. And so we get caught in this control anxiety cycle where we're constantly running to control to soothe our anxieties, and it's exacerbating it even more. This is so much of what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, people lost this sense of control, which was really just an illusion of control. And so they run over here thinking, this is going to empower me. This is going to help me feel more certain, like the world is predictable again. And then it failed. And so we ran over here. We didn't realize that we're just caught in this control anxiety cycle. And that the only way to disrupt this, this cycle is to do what Adam and Eve were ultimately unable to do, which is to take a beat and to self-reflect. What am I doing right now? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I running to this thinking that this is going to solve my problem? Is this going to solve my problem? That's the only way that we can actually disrupt this cycle. And so that is the first cost of control is anxiety. Anytime we try to control something we cannot control, it is going to create anxiety in us. And to pay attention to that whenever we're feeling anxiety, to ask, is it possible I'm trying to control something that God has not given me to control? That is number one. But this failure to self-examine, to self-reflect, it leads us to the second cost of control, And I want to return to this this interaction between Adam and God, starting in verse 9, where God is, is going to Adam, and he says to Adam, where are you? And it says, Adam answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. This question that God asks Adam, where are you? This is actually a rhetorical question. God is not wondering where Adam is. Adam didn't find the most awesome hiding place. You know, the the omniscient God of the universe isn't stumped by this great big tree. He is asking this question for Adam's sake. He is asking Adam, he's inviting Adam in this moment to pause and to self-reflect, to self-examine, how did you get here? But instead, Adam is unable to do this. Instead, he changes the subject by shifting blame. Rather than take responsibility for himself and, and asking, why, why did I do this? Why did I distrust God when God loves me and has provided everything that I needed? Why did I think that that was not enough? Adam is unable to do any of that internal work in this moment. Instead, he simply points to Eve. And then, unfortunately, Eve does the exact same thing. Rather than examine herself, she blames 
the serpent. And what both of them are doing in this moment, this is actually a control response. What they are doing is what control often does, which is to blame someone else. Because if the problem isn't me, it's them, then I can fix them, and then I can fix my problem. Rather than self-examine so that we can control the one thing that we can control, which is ourselves, we focus on somebody else and we work on fixing them. Now, here's, here's the important thing about this. In some situations, let's be honest, the problem is them. You know, like sometimes you are in a dysfunctional relationship. Sometimes there is a person who is in your life that if they were gone or if they would change, your life would be qualitatively easier. But the fact of the matter is, whether or not that is true, whether or not they are the problem or you are simply deflecting, neither changes the reality that you cannot ultimately control them. You can't change them. You simply cannot. And when we forget this, we only make the situation worse. And so this leads us to the second cost of control, which is broken relationships. Whenever we try to control people, it will always break our relationship with them for the simple reason that God did not design people to be controlled. And one of the reasons we know this is that as much as we talk about God is in control, you know, we we declare God is in control, and this is such a source of comfort for us, but one thing that we never say is that God is controlling, right? Because he's not. When we look at Genesis 1 and 2 where God reigns supreme, it's not because he is controlling Adam and Eve. They are the freest that any human has ever been. Likewise, even today with with the presence of sin, sin still, God is sovereign, and yet there is this mysterious combination where we still have free will. Those things coexist, and and we don't really understand this side of eternity, how they coexist, but we see in Scripture that they do. And so God does not control us. And if God does not control people, then neither should we. And when we forget this, when we do that which God himself does not do, it creates massive relational brokenness. And this has been so chastening to me. It's part of the reason why I decided that it was time for me to share this story of of me and Ike. I know some of you are in similar situations where you feel like me controlling this situation is actually going to prevent it from happening again. And first of all, it is not. It is not. But you are hurting your relationship with them in the interim. Now, (laughs) I, I got to tell you, though, even though I've, I've learned my lesson this, this is something that I still also have to walk out weekly with Ike because we are leading Bright City together. And so that means we have to make decisions together. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but sometimes Ike and I don't agree on everything. <laughs> are there any other married couples out there that can relate to that? Like sometimes you disagree. It's super weird, but it happens. And in that moment when we disagree about a decision in the church or a direction for the church, I can choose in that moment, because we're talking about the church now, this really matters, it's a very big deal, I can pressure him. I can, you know, try to verbally overpower him. I can coerce him. I can do whatever I can to try and make him make this decision that I think is right for the church because it's for the church. The stakes are high. But if I do that, it will cost our marriage. And I might not see that today. I might not see that tomorrow. I might not see that for five years. But it will. Now, where this especially is sobering to me, and the thing that keeps me on my knees constantly is in my parenting. Because this also holds true. On the one hand, I'm given to my children you know, as an authority in their lives. I I am given to them to lead them, to teach them, to guide them, to shepherd them, sometimes to discipline them, but I am not designed to control them. 
And if I make this mistake where I stray from this area of, of godly influence, godly stewardship into thinking it is my job to make them act a certain way, it is my job to make them choose this path for their life, it is my job to make them believe a certain way, then it is going to cost my relationship with them. And again, the, the thing that is, is so humbling and sobering to me is the reality that I probably won't see the fallout of that for 10 to 20 years. And by then, the damage is not so easily undone. Some of you have experienced this with your own parents. You had a controlling parents. You, you know what this is like. Control and healthy relationships simply cannot coexist. It is so important for us to accept this because the cost is high if we do not. So that's number two. The cost of control is broken relationships. And then as we turn to number three, I want to recall something that I mentioned in my previous point where I said that there is only one thing that we can control, which is ourselves. And we're actually next week, we're going to dive into that a lot deeper about the one form of control that we do have, the power that we do have. But that, that phrase that there, the, the one thing we can control is ourselves, it, it needs a little bit of like an asterisk to it. Because there is one part of ourselves that we cannot control, and this is so difficult for us to accept, which is that we cannot control our bodies. We see the undoing of this relationship in this story. Prior to Genesis 3, Adam and Eve feel totally at home in their bodies. But in verse 7, we see the undoing of this. It says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. What's fascinating here is that to our eyes, at least outwardly, nothing about their bodies has actually changed. What has changed in this moment is their relationship with their bodies. This, very sadly, is the seed of a war that humans have been waging against our bodies ever since. And this leads us to the third and final form of control, cost of control, that we're going to look at this morning, which is body shame. Body shame. This is the cost of believing that we can control our bodies. Now, throughout human history, philosophers and theologians have treated the body as if it is a lower form. We, we saw kind of the beginning of this in Genesis 3 where they're basically trying to hide their bodies away. But this has played out in so many different ways. And you have famous philosophers. Plato is a really notable one. Gnosticism is, is another um, philosophy that really believes this, that our minds, our spirits are our truest, highest selves whereas our bodies will ultimately pass away. And so the body is treated as, as sort of this constant encumbrance because it refuses to submit to us and, and very often is a source of real pain. And not surprisingly, this has just contributed to the brokenness that humans experience in their relationship with their bodies. It produces a disjointed vision of the human person. So this is a very old problem but what is a little bit new to our culture is, on the one hand, consumerism, so much of marketing is affirming that and basically saying, yes, your body is the problem. But guess what? This product can help you overcome that. And so we are surrounded by a culture that actually promises, yes, this is a problem, but we can help you control your body. You can control your body. Here is this procedure. Here is this product that can help you to defy aging. Here is this diet. Here is this supplement that can help you manage your weight or can protect you from getting this, this illness. And the, the fact of the matter is you might actually experience some success in this, especially if you're young and you've never experienced chronic illness. It's actually really easy to believe I don't struggle with body shame. I have a great relationship with my body, and that's because your body is submitting to you right now. But inevitably, it will not. And what happens, because our culture promises control in this, 
and you look around and see everybody else is experiencing success in this, when your body fails, it will feel as if your body has betrayed you. And so that is why when we have this control relationship with our bodies where we believe our bodies are meant to submit to us and to serve us, what it ultimately does is produce shame and contempt for our bodies instead. So those are the three, big three, costs of control. There are more anxiety, broken relationships, and body shame. And next week, what we're going to do, as I just mentioned, is we are finally going to look at what is the alternative. Because I've spent a lot of time looking at the problem, but what is the solution? And so we are going to look at that next week. But this morning, as I wrap up, I want to close by returning to what Jesus has to do with this. What does Jesus have to do with this? Even though we continue to struggle with this, struggle with the cost of control, struggle with the temptation of control, what is the good news here? Well, as we think about the quote-unquote cost of control, the consequences of trying to take matters in our own hands and the pain that this is inflicting on us as we do, I want to read you a passage from Isaiah 53, verses one through six. And to some of you, this will sound familiar. This is actually a very well-known prophecy about Jesus that is in the Old Testament. And in this passage, it's talking about Jesus being pierced for our transgressions and, and taking our pain upon himself, taking our iniquity upon himself. And I often read this thinking kind of about the atonement, the, the, the cross, in this kind of higher level, abstract understanding of sin. But as I read through this, I want you to think of this passage very specifically within this context, the cost of control that we are experiencing every day, the pain of control that we are experiencing every day and how Jesus has interceded in this cycle on our behalf. So this is Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. But surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So often we we talk about Jesus as coming to stand between us and an eternal consequence But less often do we think about the ramifications for the right here and right now. That Jesus came to stand between you and the cost of control. He came to look you in the eye and remind you, you do not have to live this way. Stop running to control to give you that which can only be had in Christ. And so right now, we're about to go into a well-known song, Jesus Paid It All. It's very Baptisty, And as you read it, it's, it's easy to think about, you know, that moment maybe when you got saved and maybe you checked that box and, and thought, you know, now I'm clear, I'm clear to go to heaven. We don't think about the implications for it right here and right now and how you're living today. 
And so I want you to use this time, as I mentioned, a lot of us are stuck in this control anxiety cycle and we need to just stop. We need to take a beat and we need to self-examine. Am I living in the truth of this song? Or am I running to control to provide me that which can only be had?